there's a, uh, there's a, there's a man here from the south, southeast of Turkey, from the border, from uh, Suruç, a town named Suruç. And this is the town where a huge bomb exploded a few months ago. This is the town that's just not very far from Kobani, across the border, where all this massive chaos has been taking place. Uh, he's preaching every Sunday. He's a pastoring a, a church there. He's preaching every Sunday to the 45, 50 Kurdish believers, and he's spreading the gospel in that area. He's been able to go into Kobani a few times, but now he says things are very difficult, and he was telling us about some of the atrocities that have taken place there. 143 kids that are orphans because their parents were shot on the streets. So it is uh, a very challenging area. And I really believe that the Lord sent him here for us to encourage him, for us to uh, strengthen him. And um, I've been speaking to him uh, in the back in my office during the worship time and just encouraging him. And I believe that the Lord is going to put some keys in his hand as he goes back later today. Uh, he began to watch us on TV back, probably back in 2007 when we first went on television. He was telling me that his wife watches every day. And uh, he was a person that we spent a lot of time contacting way, way, way back when through TV. Um, and he's come to the Lord. And uh, we have sent many materials to him over the years. So this man is a product of someone we have reached through our television ministry who's come to the Lord and who's now been raised up in ministry. It's a phenomenal story when you actually hear it. It's just totally phenomenal. And um, now they have, for the last year, they have a place that seat about 100 people. And every Sunday he's preaching in Kurdish. And uh, and uh, the, the harvest is ready among the Kurdish people. And I just really feel a stirring to go there to help him. And uh, I love going to these tough places. What a privilege and an honor to carry the gospel into these difficult places where it's just total chaos. But in the midst of that chaos, the gospel will shine forth powerfully. And, um, and the thing to understand is, you know, God will turn what the enemy has meant for evil for good. And so the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But in the midst of that, there's a tremendous opportunity for the gospel. Tremendous opportunity for the gospel. So today, I want us to uh, bless him. We're going to lay hands on him and pray. I believe that the Lord is going to put his fire on him, anoint him with, for, superna for a supernatural ministry. I, I was telling him that I really feel that this is a divine appointment for him, that, the, that he's going to go back. And when he goes back, he'll go back and his whole ministry will go to a whole new level. And so we're going to pray for him. I'm just going to follow the Holy Ghost, and at some point, I believe that we'll be able to uh, lay hands on him. I'm going to have all of our pastors come and lay hands on him. We're going to all stretch our hands out and pray, blessing on him and divine protection and provision. But more than that, Holy Ghost and fire. And as I was just talking with him in the back, sharing about some of the things from the Bible, he just says, you know, some of these things I've never heard, or you don't hear people talking about these things. And that's the problem. The church is so focused on silly theology <laughs> that it, the church is not getting the job done. I mean, the pattern is very simple. If you look in the early church, they didn't have any theology, hardly. You know, they didn't have hardly much teaching. They had very few. They had the teachings of Christ. And they had the power of the Holy Spirit. But they turned the world upside down. They said about the apostles that they said, you know, 
these men that have turned cities upside down have come to our city? Where are those men and women full of the Holy Ghost and fire moving in the supernatural power of God that's going to go and turn cities upside down? You know, and so we need to preach the gospel. And that's what this is about. And we say this, we keep talking about this every week. But I think time has come for me to go to some people that are hungry and thirsty to actually do something about the gospel. And so it, it can be a bit frustrating to come and talk to people every week, week after week, who just don't want to do anything. And then you've got guys like our brother here who is having to deal with tremendous atrocities surrounding him, but he's standing strong. And so that's where the gospel shines the brightest in the middle of darkness. And I think the problem is with many people that they just don't have that any persecution. Their life, their life is quite easy. So I don't know what it's going to take for the rest of the church to wake up across the world. Maybe more persecution. I think th things are just too easy in places like Europe, and they think that things are easy. They, they actually isn't. You know, they have a false sense of security. Many Christians have a false sense of security. This past week, I was part of a Middle East, North Africa a consultation where a, a number of pastors from the Middle East were together here in Istanbul. Uh, I didn't get to attend the night sessions because we had the RBI revival here, which was phenomenal. But during the day, I was part of, you know, getting together with about 25 or 30 church leaders. And there was a pastor from Syria, uh, Damascus. He was blind. His wife carried him around. But he has planted 22 churches in the midst of this chaos. He told me one of the churches, he has 45 children with no parents. Because they were either kidnapped for ransom money or murdered, just shot or beheaded or whatever. And so uh, you can't even get money into Syria. So people who try to help them send money into Jordan, and somebody travels across Jordan, gets the money from the bank, travels back to Damascus several hours. I mean, that's quite a way, actually. Maybe it's a 10-hour round trip. I'm not sure. Just to get a couple of hundred dollars that somebody would send the church. So you need to understand what's going on. And there are people who are true heroes of the faith. True heroes of the faith. Standing strong in the midst of adversity. And that's when the gospel truly has power. The gospel truly has power when there is persecution, when there's adversity. Amen. And so it's just amazing what's happening. And, um, and of course, you know, he was telling us, because I, I wanted to ask and find out really, you know, and we talked about this, you know, because uh, Pastor Tommy from Finland called me. He said, you know, what is the, with the deal with these, all these refugees coming to Europe? They all have iPhones, really nice designer clothes. <laughs> well, the thing is, and the pastor from Syria was saying, it's only the ones that have money who have been able to leave. So, you know, you know, you've got to have at least five, six, seven thousand, eight thousand euro to actually get out. And then they're, they're, you know, they're paying people to smuggle them. There's a whole network of paying people to smuggle them across all the different borders. Each time you cross border, it's another two thousand euro. So by the time you've crossed your second, third, fourth border, you know, you've spent a good amount of money. And so if you're making it all the way up to Finland, you must be like in the upper echelon of people leaving. And it's just all a bunch of guys in their 20s. And then, of course, you know, the refugee crisis now in Turkey will have over, well over 2 million refugees from Syria and maybe approaching 3 million. And, of course, you've got the official camps in the southeast, but then you've got the unofficial camps. And I found out something about that. What happens is they are bringing two, 3,000 people and setting them up in these uh, makeshift tent cities or putting them in an abandoned building, and they're living literally, I mean, in abject poverty, and they're paying them little amount of money to go harvest the fields. So they become basically, you know, cheap labor. And everybody knows about it, even the police and everybody else, but um, 
uh, friends of ours that used to be part of our church that launched out and, uh, and went and, and have planted the church in Ephesus, and they're going six, seven years now. They've been able to get in to some of these camps. Basically, they're kind of run by the mafia, you know, and been able to bring food every week. But the thing is the language barrier. They can't communicate the gospel in Arabic. So, and we got some Arabic speakers in our church and, and students, and I'm really believing God to be able to do something together, uh, maybe be able to send some outreach teams and to actually minister to these people and just preach the gospel because giving food is not enough. And if you really think about it, Jesus preached the gospel all day long and gave them food at the very end of it, you know. But most of the time what the church does is it gives them food and leaves, shakes hands and leaves. We've got to give the gospel. We have to present the gospel. We have to preach the gospel with signs and wonders following, with the power, full power of the kingdom. Full, I mean full, absolute full power of the kingdom. Unleash the power of the kingdom of God because the devil is unleashing hell. We must unleash heaven with power. Not this weak little sad little whiny Christianity, soft. Many Christians are soft. They are soft. They're comfortable and they're soft. I mean, they get offended and fall away because somebody didn't shake their hand. Or people getting their hands chopped off. Forget about shaking hands. The brother was telling me there, there are children with both their hands chopped off running around the streets. So, I mean, please, please. I, and I'm, I'm feeling this very strongly. I'm getting sick and tired of people whining over petty things, getting offended over petty things. When there are people out there paying the ultimate price for the kingdom with their lives, people are complaining about petty things. My God. Let's be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Amen? Amen. And, 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 you know, I had a, a group of uh, our uh, members, you know, come to me this week, and they were all crying. They were sad because some bombs went off in their, in their city. And I understand that. It, and, and, you know, it's hitting home now because people they know died or people they know are affected, and it really, <laughs> really stirred up and sad. And, and I totally understand. But it's one thing, you know, when I stand here in the pulpit, I talk about the, I, am, I've, I told the people, I, I, I said the same thing this past week in that consultation of pastors. I said, the final countdown has begun. I mean, the, the, I mean, the clock is counting back. It's, I mean, it's 9, 10, 8, 7. I mean, time is short. And I stand here and I tell people, and I've been saying this since 2011, because in 2010, the Lord just smacked me with this thing. 2010, the Lord just totally smacked me with this thing. And really, actually, it started in 2009 when I did that series on the end times. I preached a series on the end times. And, and, the, and it's just amazing how the Lord sets you up. I mean, I had a guest pastor. We were going to do a, a five programs. He came in from another city. We went into our TV studio. We were going to do five programs, and then we were sitting there, and then he had this one idea, and then and it just hit me. I said, let's do a program on the, on the final days, on the end times. And we did a, a series on the end times, and I thought, okay, I, you know what? I haven't preached about this in a while. I'll, I'll do a series in the church, which took me about a month and a half to do the series. And that month and a half, I'm telling you, I mean, the Lord shook me like you would not believe. I mean, I know eschatology. I've studied eschatology. I've had eschatology classes. I've, it's like something that I've personally loved studying. I've studied it for 20 plus years as a Christian. And, and, and just, I've read many books. I've, I've got all kinds of charts, prophecies, old, time, old Testament prophecies, New Testament prophecies, the book of Revelation. And I mean, and I've been taught with, by some of the best like Dr. Hilton Sutton, who went home to be with the Lord, and he actually came and taught us when I was in Bible school. And then I had his videos, I had his books. I mean, and just some of the, uh, you know, just some amazing 
teaching I've had. But that month and a half, two months, 2009, when I personally, like, it was something different. Something shifted. It was like the heavens opened. It was like the curtain was pulled back. And it, it was just, my goodness. And then 2010, the Lord tells me, I, I get up here one Sunday and I begin to prophesy. 2011 will be a year of revelation. Well, when you prophesy things, you prophesy to yourself as well. And then I said, and he, these, are, these were the words that came out of my mouth that have truly shaped the ministry the last five years. Those who live by information in these final days will not make it. Only those who live by revelation will overcome. There is a false sense of security in the church. Many are not ready for what's coming. They are not prepared. We must prepare the people for the final days. We must prepare the people for the end times. We must prepare the church. We must sound the alarm. And so then we hit 2011. And 2011 ended up being one of the greatest years of revelation in my personal life. As the Lord just completely, because 2011, beginning of March, I think it was about the end of February, beginning of March. I can't exactly remember. I think it was early March. Remember 2011, the whole Arab Spring started. What they were starting to call Arab Spring. Start, you know, had been going on in other nations, but the, the thing in Egypt really became the big one. And people were very confused about what was really happening with the Arab Spring. And then, and then I got very frustrated, very frustrated with everything in the church, what's going on in the church, all the denominationalism, people just fighting, division. And then, of course, you look at the world. The world is fighting. Wars, rumors of wars, and then there are wars and rumors of wars in the church world too. Same thing, same thing that's going on in the world. Political infighting is going on in the church. You know, same confusion you see in the world system is going on in the church. And I thought something is just that doesn't match. And I mean, I know, I knew some things, but I just, want, I, I just decided to shut everything out. So I'm going to shut everything out. And I, wanted, I started to just fast and pray, and I was just crying out to God. I literally got on my face and my knees. I said, God, you've got to show me what's going on. You've got to, I've got to see things with your eyes. Give me your eyes to see. Give me your ears to hear. Give me your understanding. Like, open, you know, peel back the curtain that I may see what's going on in the world, in this nation. What's going on? You've got to show me. You've got to speak to me. Because everybody... In Turkey was also starting to get worried about the rise of radical Islam and all these other things, you know. But the thing is, it's, yes, it is a spiritual issue, obviously, but there are political, geopolitical forces behind it. So I go to bed one night in this time of praying and fasting and praying and seeking the Lord. I said, I'm shutting off the internet. I'm, I'm going to stop watching any news on television. I'm not, not going to read any News on the internet. I'm not going to read any news on the newspaper. Not that I read the newspaper much anyways. I don't even ever buy one. If I ever see one somewhere, I, may, I might just look into, uh, take me about 30 seconds, look at the front page, look in the back, da, 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 it's done. You know. But you've got to show me what's going on, Lord. And then I wake up in the middle of the night. I stood up in bed. Holy Ghost woke me up. I stood up in bed, and the Lord spoke to me audibly, audibly, two words, money changers. Money changers. And I mean, it's the last thing I ex sort of expected to hear, money changers. Here I'm crying out to God to show me what's going on in Turkey, what's going on in, you know, in America, in Europe, in the geopolitical thing, scene, in the church. Show me what's going on. And the Lord says, money changers. It was audible. I mean, it came so strong. I knew the Lord spoke to me, and I couldn't even sleep. I got up, and I mean, of course, I know I go straight to my office, I opened the Bible and I begin to, I found the, the, I found the, the text on the money changers where Jesus goes into the temple and cleanses the temple. He confronts, I mean, he gets lit, violent, physically violent with these money changers in the temple. It's in all four of the Gospels. It's in all four of the Gospels. And I read all of them. 
You know, of course, you have the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, very similar. And then you have John, which is different than the synoptic gospels, the three. And then I read all of them. Of course, he calls them brutal vipers. He calls them thieves. Uh, he calls them merchandisers. So they were conducting business, merchandising. Of course, they were selling, buying and selling in the temple, the courtyard, the court of the Gentiles, which is where everybody could come in. Even the Gentiles could come in there and be evangelized. It was supposed to be a showcase, a showroom for the glory of God. But if you walked in, it was no longer a showroom for the glory of God. It was just this place of conducting business, buying and selling, exchanging money, greed, greed, thieves, stealing, robbing the people. And I begin to read, and the Lord spoke to me. He says, I want you to study money, banking, because the word money changers doesn't really mean anything today. It's not something we really use. Well, in Turkey, maybe you're a little bit more familiar with it because there are change offices all along here. And so you're always changing dollars to Turkish lira, euros, whatever. Most countries, they don't really change money. But here, at least you have an idea of a change office. Even uh, if, if I go to America, I talk about a change office. They don't even know what that means. They've never even seen a change office. You know, so they, just, they don't even understand that. At least we have change offices here where you're changing money. Okay? But that's not what the money changers were doing because they were buying and selling, and they were actually buying, uh, and they were selling the, the animals to be sacrificed for the offerings. But it was even beyond that. And the Lord says, I want you to study because the, the, the modern-day terminology for money changers is bankers, okay, bankers, banking. So what was happening in, in that courtyard was a combination of the three main elements of the modern-day world system. One side is the banking. The other side is the political government system where they're making the laws, okay? And on the third side is the education and media where the information is given to the people, okay? So the Lord said, I want you to study banking. I want you to study what money is, how money is created. And I mean, I spent about three months, hundreds of hours just studying, 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 studying. And I would, sometimes I would scream and shout from my office. My wife is in the kitchen. I'm like, ah, I'm shouting in anger. And I run in here and I'm trying to say, honey, do you, do you even know, do you know what they have done? Do you know what they have done? Do you know what they have done? In anger, because I begin to see how literally, literally millions of people died in wars and were literally sacrificed for the sake of profiting and money and how money is created and how money is manipulated and how basically the money changers run the planet. That's what I discovered. Now, politicians don't run the planet. The money changers, the banks, run the planet because all the banks are private businesses, including all the central banks. The Federal Reserve that controls the U.S. dollar, it's not really a government money. It's called Federal Reserve Note. The Nigerian Central Bank and the Ghanaian Central Bank and the European Central Bank, ECB. The Bank of England, the Bank of France, Deutsche Bank, Banque de France, all of these. Play on names. You think it's some kind of a government institution. You think it's there for the people. You think it's France. It's the French people's. No. You think it's the, uh, they say the, you know, the uh, <laughs> Central Bank of the Turkish Republic. You, so you think it's something that has to do with the Turkish Republic or the people, the public. No. These are all private banks. Private banks. Businesses. What's the number one purpose of a business? Profit, to make profit. So these are businesses who are designed to make profit. 
How do you make more profit? Lower your expense. Increase your profit margin. What comes in, when what comes in is bigger than what goes out, you have more profit. It's very simple. So, and everything in the world system is designed by the bankers, pushed through into laws, established as systems, political and governmental systems through politicians who are controlled by the bankers. Plain and simple. So, in the time of Jesus, you had the three-headed monster. The Pharisees, the lawmakers, and the money changers. Doctors of the law. They made the law. They claimed to have the law of Moses, the word of God, but they took it and they made other laws out of it. And they told people, this is the law. So they were the lawmakers. So they were like the legislators, the parliament. They made the law. The Pharisees' job was to indoctrinate people with the law and execute the law. So they were the executive branch. They executed the law. And they were also like the judicial branch because they, they were, the, they were the, the, the judges. So their job was to teach because the Pharisees were the people's teachers. So they were, their job was to teach the people how to submit to the system, how to accept this corrupt system as the law and as the way to live and as the right way to live. And then you had the money changers who were pretty much behind the scenes. You don't even see them until the last week when Jesus finally comes into Jerusalem. Because that, that was their center. That was the banking center. was right in the courtyard of the temple was the banking center. Today the banking center is in London. It's called the city of London. Smack dab in the middle of London is a place called the city of London, which is separate from London. It's owned by the bankers, and it is the world's financial capital. Then you have another city called Washington, D.C. That one's also separate from the United States. It's the District of Columbia. and th That's where the Pentagon is, and that's the military capital of the world. Those are the ones that enforce the geopolitical agenda of the money changers the bankers, and then you have the Vatican, which is another city. And that's the religious capital of the world that tries to influence all religious affairs. That's why you have this Pope running around all over the place, praying in the mosques, meeting with Buddhists, meeting with Imams. I mean, you know, that's what he does. It, and what is the ultimate agenda? One world government, one world money system, one world religion. The rule of the one-man dictator, this demonic, Lucifer-filled, Luciferian dictator called the Antichrist. Now, the Bible tells us that the spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. It's all, always been there. Antichrist, that means against Christ, against the anointing. But the Antichrist is a spirit, but ultimately will manifest in itself. That spirit will manifest or become embodied, just like the word of God, Jesus became flesh. The Son of God became flesh, was on the earth. This Antichrist will become flesh. And we see him in the book of Revelation. He'll become flesh. He will announce himself to be the God of this world. And everyone will have to bow to him and worship him. And how does he control? Through the mark of the beast, which is what? Buying and selling. So there will be this one centrally controlled financial system i don't even want to say money anymore because money as you know it will no longer exist by that time because money will not be paper by the time i mean paper money is only three to seven percent of whatever currency you're talking about there's only paper in three to seven percent remember what happened in greece the last few months people are running to the banks to get cash because of the fear there's no cash everybody cannot get cash you cannot convert 
the digital money you see on the computer screens into enough paper cash because there's not enough paper cash. So there was total chaos. And then the supermarket shelves are empty. Because whatever, as soon as they got money, they went and bought all the food. I mean, can you imagine in a city like Istanbul, what will happen when there's a food or money shortage? Can you imagine? People are already on the edge just on a normal day beating each other up on the streets. What would happen if something like that happened? I mean, it would be total chaos hell. I'm sorry to say. I'm just telling you. I'm not trying to put fear in you. I'm just trying to pose the question, what if? Because, you know, when I preach these things and people listen to amen and then a bomb goes off in their city and some of their people that they know are injured or dead and then all of a sudden it hits home and like, wow, I mean, what the pastor's talking about is, is real. Now I'm personally affected by it. Not really, you're still thousands of kilometers away, but you are emotionally affected, obviously, I understand that. You know? But here's the thing. So, the money changers. How did they operate? What was their modus operandi? What was, how did they operate? I take you back to Matthew 17. In Capernaum. Jesus is traveling with his company of disciples and preaching. And remember the tax collectors. But not the tax collectors like Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector for the Romans. Okay? But the Pharisees come the enforcers of the law come to peter and ask him do you not pay and does your master not pay the temple tax now what was this temple tax what 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 is this temple tax why is it so important that they're coming to them in capernaum and asking for the temple tax we have checked our records we don't see that you have paid your temple tax this year so they obviously had records they had good accounting they were keeping records of who was paying the taxes and who was not paying the taxes. Amen? What is the number one power that any governmental system has over its citizens? Taxation. Taxation is the number one power that they have. Even as a kid, I remember, I'll, I'll never forget, I mean, even as a kid, I, he I heard these two things growing up. There are two things that are inevitable, death and taxes. There are two things that are guaranteed. Everybody will die and everybody will pay taxes. I mean, that was it. I mean, I remember hearing that even as a kid. It, it, you laugh at it and then now you realize how real that is. How true that is. And it is true. There's no way you can get away from taxes. You go buy lunch, you're going to pay tax today. Every, everybody today will pay tax. The moment you spend any money, you will pay tax. Okay. And of course, if you're... In Turkey or in the European Union, you'll pay ridiculous amount of taxes. I mean, 25%, 23%, those kinds of taxes. You buy a car in Turkey, my God, you can pay 45%, 90%, or up to 130% tax plus the VAT, 18%, tax on the tax. So in, any car under 1.6 liter engine, 45% ÖTV, which is the special transportation tax plus the 18 percent tax on it that's 58 percent if you have a 1.6 to 2 liter engine 90 percent tax plus the 18 percent sales tax two liter and up 130 percent tax plus 18 percent that's why everybody has these tiny little cars here nobody 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 can really afford the big cars and the ones that you see the, all the big cars people driving around Usually, they're buying them through their companies and getting tax deductions, things like that. And they have ways to get out of taxes because the rich never pay taxes. Rich know all the ways to get out of taxes. They have tax havens. They have lawyers, accountants. They know exactly how not to pay taxes, okay? And the super rich, they make money on all the taxes. Forget paying taxes. They make money on everybody's taxes. All right. So they come to Jesus or Peter. Asking for the temple tax. What was the temple tax? Well, it was actually originally called the tribute tax. The tribute, the temple tribute. It was established in the time of Moses. You can read it in the book of Exodus. I don't have the exact reference, but you can find it. 
every male at the age of 20 in Israel was supposed to pay half a shekel silver tax at each census. So it was not annual. Whenever there was a census, as they would count, how old are you? Tell me how old are you? 29. You qualify. Congratulations. No, <laughs> it was not a bad thing. It was supposed to be to support the work of the temple, support the work of the ministry. And it was supposed to be half a shekel silver to redeem your life. So it would actually be a blessing to you. God would bless you. That was redemption money. You paid the price for your redemption in half a shekel and you were blessed as a result of it. And you had access to the temple or the presence of God. God instituted as a blessing to the people. But the lawmakers and the Pharisees twisted the scriptures. They made it an annual tax for everybody to pay. And if you didn't pay, they would come repossess your goods. So now what happens? When you put a law like that, what, is, what does it give you? It gives you what? Power. Control. It gives you power of the people. Taxation, power of the people. Well, great. Half a shekel silver. Shekel is a weight. So they have to weigh it. It wasn't standard money like we have today. It wasn't paper. It was either silver or gold or even copper. Remember the woman brought the two mites, two, two copper money put it in the, te in the temple, and that was all she had, and Jesus said she had given more than all of them. Okay. That was the most worthless money, basically. It wasn't even considered money. Half a shekel silver. So they come to Peter, they ask him for the temple tax. Are you going to pay it? Does your master pay it? So Peter comes to, to Jesus. Jesus says, they're asking for the temple tax, aren't they? He says, yes. What does Jesus say? The sons are exempt. Who's a son? Them that are led by the Spirit of God, according to the Word of God, full obedience to the Word of God, are sons of God. So, because this was an illegal tax, illegal considering the Scriptures, it was unlawful according to God's law. It was man's law, but it was unlawful in God's sight. So they didn't have to pay it. Jesus said, we are exempt. In other words, if we don't pay this, we will not be in violation of God's word. We know that Jesus fulfilled God's word, 100% obedience. There was no sin in him. So he says, if I don't pay this tax, it's not sin. But he said, lest we offend them or lest we give them a reason to come after us, to harass us, to arrest us, to beat us or to take our goods, let's pay it and get them out of our way. In other words, let, it's a small thing. Let's not have this thing bother us. So we have the freedom to operate and do our ministry. Otherwise, they're going to be chasing after you all the time. We don't need that. He says, go catch one fish. Put a hook down. Not even a net. Put a hook down. Catch one fish. Now, Peter was a fisherman. So he knows how to fish, but he doesn't fish with hooks. Fishermen fish with nets. And you know, there were times when he was out all night put down nets and caught nothing. Remember the first time Jesus came to his boat? He was out all night. He caught nothing. Can you imagine working all night? And zero. You come back with zero. You're tired. You caught nothing. And now he's cleaning his nets. He's pulling the weed out of the nets, mending his nets. Hard labor and no results. And then Jesus gets in the boat. And now, of course, the nets are filled with fish. They're about to break. The boat is filled with fish. It's about the sink. They have to call their, you know, partners and, and share. I mean, a supernatural catch. Hundreds and hundreds of fish. Hundreds and hundreds of fish. I mean, lake fish are not that big. To fill a boat, it's thousands of fish. Two boats, thousands of fish. Thousands of fish. Amen. But this time, all he needs is one fish. He catches this one fish. Jesus says, you will find a coin, go pay your tax and my tax. That means it's one shekel. Half shekel for you, half shekel for me. One shekel silver coin. I did some research. It's about three denarii. One shekel silver coin was three denarii of the Romans. Three denarii is three days of labor. One denarii was one day's 
of income for an average laborer. So you can say average income was one denarii for three days. So three days of work. And you know for a fisherman, I mean it could be a week maybe sometimes because some, some days are better than others. Some days there's nothing. So can you imagine working for a whole week just to pay a tax that you're not even supposed to pay? What does that make you? There's a word that starts with an S. Slave, thank you. Slaves work for free, don't they? So taxation really is a modern day of modern form of slavery. Because all your effort or your labor is going to pay a tax. Do you understand me? That's illegal. And when you find out what's done with this tax, you'll even get more angry now. Watch. So you working three days. Let's just say three days. He had three great days. Three days just to pay a tax. Because taxation is what? Debt. When there's a tax, it's a debt. Amen? It's a debt. Do you understand me? It's a debt. It's a debt to whoever collects the taxes. If you can't pay the debt, they'll come and repossess your goods. The Bible has several stories of God delivering people supernaturally out of debt. Like the woman who had, her husband had died, was one of the prophets and left her a debt and they were about to come and take her two sons away. Why would they take the two sons? To work for the debt. Into slavery, basically, to work for the debt. Work for labor, for free labor to pay the debt. And, of course, the oil multiplied, and the Lord supernaturally delivered her out of the debt. And when she sold the oil, she not only paid the debt, she had m much left to live for the rest of her life. I mean, come on. That's supernatural deliverance. Supernatural debt cancellation. Amen? The borrowed axe head. The borrowed axe. The axe head flew off and sunk, and the prophet threw a stick into the water, and the axe head, the iron, swam to the top. How many times have you seen iron swim on top of a river? And the borrowed axe head was recovered. Otherwise, he would have been in debt to try to pay off for the borrowed axe head or the borrowed axe which without the axe head. So again, there was supernatural del deliverance when it looked like everything sunk the Lord supernaturally raised it up. Amen. Amen. So then Jesus supernaturally puts this one shekel silver coin in the mouth of the fish, and Peter goes to pay the temple tax for himself and for Jesus, and they get off their back. Now, where did that half shekel silver come from? What was that representing? Well, here's the story I found out. What, this is what was happening in the temple. The money changers, remember, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, we hear about them throughout the Gospels, right? They were sects. But the money changers were the most powerful sect in Israel at the time. Money changers were the bankers. And working together... They realized that if they worked together, they could make more profit than competing with each other. So basically, it's a cartel. Cartel, what is a cartel? You have drug cartels, banking cartels, oil cartels, you know. Cartel is just a few people controlling a resource to increase their profits. Because what drives prices down? Competition. What drives prices up? Monopolies. So the money changers had a monopoly on the system. Because that's why the Bible calls them the money changers. It's like one. Many of them, but like one group, one name, one group working together. A, a, a banking cartel working together. A banking mafia. Like banksters. I call them banksters. Because just because they have Oxford and Harvard educations and wear nice, expensive Armani suits doesn't mean they're nice people. They are some of the most wicked, demon-possessed, demon greedy people on the planet. You understand? Is this helping anybody here today? Some of you have heard this before, but others have never heard it. So I got to share this. I got to put this also on video to get this information, this revelation out to people. 
So here's what they were doing. I don't have any cash on me, but somebody, uh, does anybody have a dollar on them? I left my wallet, one dollar bill. You got a dollar? Thank you. Hundred dollars. Nice. Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> Benji's on it. It's paper. This is a U.S. There's a lot of writing on this. If you had euros, there wouldn't be any writings on it. The only thing you would see is ECB and the acronyms of it in the different languages and the number. That's all you would see. But there seems to be a few more information on here. But it seems like the more letters and numbers they put on it, the more official it looks. The more stamps and signatures you get in Turkey, the more official the paper is, you know, bureaucracy. But it says Federal Reserve Note. In other words, Federal Reserve. There's an entity called the Federal Reserve that has created a note. Now, what is a note? A piece of paper, basically, that's what it means. The original notes were paper certificates given for gold or silver that you had in deposit. So it was a paper certificate representing a, an amount of gold or silver that you had deposit somewhere. Okay? So the, the original banking system, which was already operating in the time of Jesus, but what we know as the current modern-day banking system started in the Middle Ages in Europe with the goldsmiths and the silversmiths who were predominantly Jews, Ashkenazi Jews, not real Jews, synagogue of Satan, those who say they're Jews but they lie. They're Khazarians. You can research that out. But here's the thing. The goldsmiths or the silversmiths, they had these huge big safes and bodyguards to guard them, so you felt safe to put your gold in there. Now, you don't want to travel with a bunch of gold on you. It's heavy. It's sacks of gold. You don't want to do that. So you, it's better to have a certificate. So even if you lose it, you can still go because they have a copy of it and they know you. So it was this whole thing about safety. We keep your real money in deposit, the gold and the silver, and we give you a certificate. You can use the certificate to do your business, conduct your business, right? Because before that, it was barter economy. If I had apples, I gave you one kilo of apples. You gave me one kilo of cucumbers. It's easy when I want cucumbers and you want apples. We can agree easily. Come on. <laughs> but I bring you a kilo of apples. You say, I don't like apple pie. I want cherries. I don't have cherries. He's got cherries. So now I've got to go to him, give him my apples, get cherries, come back to you, give you my cherries, and get my, you know. Get cucumbers. Well, he's got cherries, but he doesn't want apples. Oh, this is getting more complicated now. She's got bread. You want bread. Okay, I've got to go find somebody who wants bread. Can I have your bread? Give you my <laughs> apples now. So I can give the bread to him to get the cherries. Get the cherries and give him the cherries to get the cucumbers I want. Barter economy. That's how it happened in the early days. But as people traveled more, Economies that were very local, small villages grew. Now you need to have a medium of exchange. And money simply became a medium of exchange. And so the paper certificate, or what they call the paper notes, became the representation of something of actual value, or what people could agree on having actual value, that was deposited somewhere safety account a secure account and you had the paper notes i got a hundred grams of gold oh wonderful i'll take your hundred grams of gold it's still paper but it represents hundred grams of gold so that's how the whole paper system evolved that's why it's still called a note it's an iou an a piece of paper when I, was in, when I was a kid, I'd go to my friend, can I borrow one lira? I want to buy a simit. And we would write each other, I owe you one lira. Give him the paper. <laughs> did you ever do that? Whoever did that? Let me see your hand. Who, did you ever do that? So you know, you know what I'm talking about. You, you did that? Okay. That was money. That was one lira. That paper with my handwriting was one lira. 
because I owed him one lira. And if I didn't pay him, he said, you owe me one lira. See, you got a signature on it. And it beat me up and take my one lira from my pocket, collect the money if I didn't pay it. Or he'd come with his father, my daddy can beat your daddy and I want my one lira. That's what money is. It's an IOU paper. So you take this $100. You open a dollar account at, say, Akbank, Ishbank, because the guarantee, whatever. Not much guarantee there, but <laughs> they want you to think it's guaranteed, but it's not. They want you to think it's Akbank, but it's Karabank. <laughs> it's not very clean. So you, you go to the bank teller, you give them $100. They put it in your account in your name, 100. Now, you don't have the paper anymore, but on, on a computer screen, you see 100. The bank owes you 100, because if you go, you, can, you should be able to collect it. Hey, I gave you 100. I want it back. But things have changed so much, the banks will just say, we have no money. <laughs> what are you going to do then? What are you, you going to do? What are you going to do? Sorry, sir, we don't have any money. If you got like ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars, they'll tell you we don't have it. Come back in two days, we'll get the money for you. Because they don't even have the money in the reserves. Because it's not one to one anymore. The reserves are not one to one. During the crash of two thousand seven, some of the commercial banks were loaning up to eighty times more than what they had in reserve. Eighty times more. They were giving you money they did not even have. Can you imagine, you go going to the guy, he's giving you money he doesn't have, but he creates the money by pressing a button, boom, $10,000 loan out to you. Now you got to pay them interest on the money they loaned you, which they never had. They created the money the moment they pressed the button. So the banks actually create the money. Because of the whole digital system, they have more power now. Do you understand? Because they don't even have to print the paper anymore. They push a button. And now Sweden, next year will be the first cashless society. Denmark said they will follow. There will be no cash in Sweden or Denmark. And other nations will become cashless. Chip money. Nice. That's even easier to control. Push one button and freeze everybody's chip. How convenient is that? My goodness. Nice. Well, also, I mean, that chip money is on a, in a plastic. You might lose it. So we don't want you to lose it. Let's put it in your under your skin so you don't lose it hmm that's even more people say oh yes that's even more secure they think that it's they're secure they're not it is a false sense of security it's a lie you understand okay so let's go back to the temple what was happening in the temple same exact thing that's happening today because on this money you will you find this writing this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. It doesn't say this money is a blessing for your prosperity. It says this is for debt. This is for paying off debt. So we're going to create more debt so you need more of this. Let's create more debt. How do we create more debt? Wars. Wars are the quickest way to create more debt. Create debt and fear. That's even more powerful. That's a double-edged monster from hell. Debt and fear. Woo. Debt and create debt, debt and, and, and fear. Public and private debt. So, here's what was happening in the temple. In my research, here's what I found out. The money changers, working together with the Pharisees and the doctors of the law, created a system, created a tax, and then created a legal tender, which would be the only ways to pay for the tax. Because... If you go to America, or even in Turkey, obviously, you can still shop with this. Some places will take this. 
But most places will not take this. They say, give us Turkish money. So now you have to go exchange it to get Turkish money, right? And then every day there's some kind of a rate. And it's always fluctuating, right? Who's making that rate? The central banking system is making that rate. Everybody was afraid because the Federal Reserve last Friday was going to announce the new interest rate. Everybody. The whole world was watching one man, the governor of the Federal Reserve, to have a press conference where he would announce the new interest rate. Everything was at standstill. Frozen watching the press conference. The whole world was watching. The, all of the economies of the world was dependent on this one man announcing the interest rate. That's power. That is ultimate power. Everything was frozen. Transactions, people were not even doing business. Governments were waiting. All the other central banks, the little banks, <laughs> the subservient banks of the big banks are waiting. The master bank. Yes, master. No, that's how it is. They, he announced, no change, and everybody went, Because <gasps> if he announced, listen, even a quarter percent change on Friday, tomorrow, the dollar will probably be about 3.3 .3 here in Turkey. Probably just a, about a 10, 15 percent, maybe jump like that. Something like that. 20 percent. That, that's how it would be. And how does that affect all your businesses, guys? The high dollar exchange rate. But it's affecting your business, isn't it? The, the system is affecting how you conduct your business, your personal life. If you got dollars, it's good. You exchange them, you get more money. But if you're conducting your business based on dollars and people have to exchange their less valuable money to get this, it's a big problem. So the money changers produced or manufactured or created a new money called the temple money. They actually called it half shekel silver coin of the temple. And you come to the temple to pay your tribute tax, but it goes beyond the tribute tax now. You want to pay your tithes. You've come from Damascus. You're a Jew. You come from Damascus because remember, when Jesus cleansed the temple, it was right before what? The Passover. All the Jews all over the world were required to come to Jerusalem, make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem at the Passover week. So you got about 250, 300,000 Jews coming to Jerusalem. All of a sudden, Jerusalem's population is like quadruple, trip, you know, whatever, tenfold increase in the population. Great opportunity for business. You understand me? Look at all these people coming. And they've got Roman money, Greek money, whatever kind of money they have. It's no good here. You have to exchange it for the silver coins, the temple coins, the holy money, the legal tender. So you, now here come. You, you, you want to pay your tithes? You can't pay your tithes. We, we don't want that. You have to exchange it. You say, well, it's gold. It's unclean gold. It's got Caesar's money, Caesar's face on it. It's unclean. You have to cl cleanse the money, launder the money. That's what the mafia always does, money laundering. Clean the money. Exchange it for the holy, pure money. The blessed money. Silver coins of the temple, which we are making in the back. Pressing them in, pressing the silver in these in these cutters and things, the shapes that we have. We're pressing these. You have to get it from us. So now they're exchanging it. If they have a monopoly and they are the only source, my God, they could charge the people as much as the market could bear. So they were making exorbitant amounts of, um, a, amount of money on the silver and the gold exchange. And they were shaving off of the gold and the silver. Little by little, shave, shave, shave. But what made Jesus even more angry is they became the gatekeepers. They set up shop in the courtyard. The only passage between the outside 
and the inside. This narrow place where you have to pass through to offer your sacrifices, offer the animals, the sin offerings, the trespass offerings, the peace offerings, all the offerings you have to offer, you have to go. So before you could get to God, you have to go through the money changers. Do you see now? They become the gatekeepers. You cannot even get to God until you go through them. They're holding back the tithes. They're holding back the worship. Because what does tithes, offerings represent? Worship. So they are preventing people from worshiping God. And they're making money off of worship. Jesus comes in and I mean, he's like, the righteous, holy indignation is unleashed with a full force. Boom! He's like turning over tables. He makes whips and he's literally whipping these demon-possessed thieves, he calls. My father's house is to be a house of prayer or worship because prayer is the highest form of worship. This is supposed to be a place of worship. This is supposed to be a place where Sweet smelling aroma of worship is supposed to go up to God, but there's a disgusting stench of greed. So the money changers were the bankers, the Pharisees and the doctors of the law were the government to collect the tax because, I mean, I can just... Tear off a piece of paper from this thing, write 100, draw a little picture, sign it, make a little few wiggly lines, take some coloring pencils and color them in and make it look a little bit nicer and money. I just created money. You laugh at me. You say, that's not money. Yes, it is. Well, you're right. It's not money until somebody needs it. The moment somebody needs it, it's it becomes valuable because it has no value. But if I tell you that the only way to pay your tithes at the river is to exchange it for this money, then you would want it. I mean, it sounds ridiculous. I mean, I would, I would be the first one out the door, but you understand what I'm saying. Now there's demand for it. The moment there's a demand or a need for it, it becomes valuable. And it becomes powerful. And whoever has it has control of it and can manipulate it and can, can, can do things with it beyond the power of money. Now they can begin to touch the realm of politics, realm of religion, realm of education. Because let me ask you a question. How many of you were taught this in school? Raise your hand if you were taught this in school. What I'm teaching you now. Who was taught this in school? Nobody. Next question. How many of you were heard things on the news or television? People trying to educate you about the reality of what I'm saying right now. How many of you heard this on TV? Nobody. So the whole education and media system hides this truth from the people because the people at the top that control the education, that control religion, that control the media, are either the bankers or work for the bankers. Because the banks own the companies. Because the companies are also in debt to the bankers. Just like nations are in debt to the bankers. How many of us have heard about national debt of our nation? Every nation has debt. Look at what's happening in Europe. Look at what's happening in Europe. Eight hundred thousand. Was it eight hundred? Germany said they would take eight hundred thousand refugees. Is that what they said? Do you know what the cost is? Well, Europe is primely set. They're set up because through the European Union in the last fifty years since World War II, they have developed a socialist system. Europe is a socialist government. Socialism, welfare socialism, take money, 
from the ones who have it, give it to the ones who don't have it. Well, what does it mean to take money from the ones who have it? It's called taxation. So you take, I take tax from you, give it to the guy who is doing nothing. So by bringing in more refugees, what do you have to do now? You have to finance the whole system. Education for them, food, clothing, medical, healthcare. Everything has to be financed by the government, which creates what? More debt. The banks love it. The banks are like, send more refugees. Send more refugees. Refugi I'm sorry, they're sitting in, in Basel, Switzerland, at the International Bank of Settlements, which is the central bank of the central banks. All the governors of the central banks once a month fly into Basel, Switzerland to this big towel. I call it the Tower of Basel. <laughs> and the top tier, the top tier of the central banks, the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve Bank. Well, it's not federal and it has no reserves. So it's a lie. It's a private banking cartel. European Central Bank, private banking cartel. Same guys own the, both banks. So the same guys, what happened to the hundred? <laughs> it turned to five lira. <laughs> Here you go. I exchanged it for you. I'm just teasing you. You have no power. I say, I have all the power. You only, I, can, I give you whatever I want. You have to shut up and take it. That's how it works. You had a hundred. So, sorry, there's a war. There's an oil shortage. Uh, there's a financial crisis. There's a refugee crisis. Sorry, we, uh, your hundred now just only became five. That's absolute power of the bankers. People in Greece running to the banks. Sorry, we're closed. They shut the ATMs down. People couldn't even get their cash. What are you going to do? Nothing. What are you, riots? The police work for them, come and beat you to pieces. I mean, the G20 summit takes place. People go to protest. I mean, riot police come and beat the, them to oblivion. Shut up. It's a dictatorship. It's a total dictatorship. And that's the system of the Antichrist. That's why you cannot trust in this thing. You can't worship this. You can't feel attached to this. You can't think that I need this. You don't need this. You need God's provision. You might need to catch a fish and find this, but you don't, it's not this that you need. You need God's provision. So you need to, that's why I'm trying to prepare you guys to have faith. To have faith for supernatural provision. Believe God's word. You might have a debt. You don't need money to pay off the debt. You need just a little bit of oil you have to multiply. Do you understand? God has different ways of providing for you. When, Jesus ne uh, when Peter needed the tax money, Jesus did not send him to the money changers to get the half shekel. He worked outside of that system. Because that system he hated and that system he had come to destroy. And he attacked that system. He turned that system upside down. He destroyed that system when he walked into the temple. And the Bible says he did not allow them to conduct their business anymore in the temple. My God, that's power. That God is showing who really has the power? And that's when they decided to kill him. They didn't kill him because he was preaching a different doctrine. They killed him because he touched the money. And what did they do? They set up a conspiracy. They bribed somebody, just like they do today. They bribed somebody from the inside named Judas, who had a wicked heart. And they gave him how much? 30 pieces of what? Silver. Where did that silver come from? The money changers. It's their money. Or maybe they stole it from the taxes. To pay off this man to murder another one who was challenging the system. And that's what happens today. Anybody heard of John F. Kennedy? President of the United States. Riding around in an open convertible. In the middle of the street, shot in the head. How convenient is that? You know why they shot him in the head? Because 11 days before he was assassinated, he signed an executive order to begin to dissolve the Federal Reserve. 
and he said we must print debt free money using the gold reserves of the United States to help the people and they killed him right in the smack in the middle of the street put it in front of everybody in the world saying all you government leaders watch this don't touch us because this will happen to you that's how these people operate so the whole crisis in the Middle East ISIS funded by the same bankers the refugee crisis into Europe funded by the same bankers just to create more debt, create a monopoly over the oil. It's Africa, diamonds, gold. The tribes fight and kill each other, the warlords. Why? While the bankers and the big time greedy money changers come and take the gold and the silver and, and, all, the, and all the diamonds. They turn people against each other. They think they're fighting for some stupid ideology or some stupid piece of ground, and some cows, or some mountains. No. It's about the resources. It's about the resources. And God blessed man. He said, I'll give you dominion of all the resources. I've given them to you. And Satan knows that we have access to these resources because of God's blessing. So what, is he, what does the thief do? He comes through deception. Federal Reserve, that's a deception in name. Turkish, uh, uh, Central Bank of the Turkish Republic, that's a deception in name. He comes through all kinds of deception, all kinds of temptation. He comes through hidden secret conspiracies to gain control over the resources. Because ultimately, even the money changers know this is worthless because now this is fiat money. There is no gold or silver backing this anymore. This is fiat money. Anybody heard the word, word fiat? Yeah, you know, there's a bunch of cars called fiat, right? It's Italian. Well, it's actually Latin. You know what fiat means? Let there be. Fiat money. Let there be money. That means God said, let there be light. He created light out of nothing. So they're saying, let there be money, fiat money. They create money out of nothing. Because this is nothing. This is nothing. This has, this has no value. There is no gold or even silver to back this anymore. I have the old money from the, back from the 30s and stuff. It says United States note, not Federal Reserve note, United States note before the days of John F. Kennedy and all that kind of stuff. And of course, 1973, the Nixon shock, they completely dissolved the entire gold system. I have some old silver certificates and gold certificates. It says actually on it, there's a number on it. See, there's always a number. What is that number? Well, it, that number used to represent a piece of gold that had the same number on it. So you could actually take this. They look at the certificate number, give you that piece of gold or that piece of silver. But there is no more gold or silver. Where is the gold and the silver? Well, it's in Switzerland. <laughs> safe. Nice and safe. How come Switzerland has never been in any wars? It's where all the gold and the silver is. Nobody's going to touch that. How come all the Swiss citizens are armed to the teeth, have weapons, and everybody have weapons? Why? Protect the money. You think they're protecting their, their nation? Yeah, that's what the average citizen would think. But they're, they're trying to protect the money. It's always about the money. The love of money is the root of all evil. Wars, root of all evil, money. Murder, lies, conspiracies, political conspiracies, chaos, immigration crisis, oil crisis, mortgage bubble bursting, Everything, it all comes down to the root of all evil, the love of money, greed. 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 Control of the money system, money supply. And they will come to the point where you'll have to take the mark of the beast to buy or sell. What will believers do at that time? Will they bow to the antichrist? To take the mark just to survive so they can find some food to eat, water to drink, clothes to put on, things that Jesus said that we should not worry about. Don't worry about what you will eat, what you will wear. So what will believers do at the time? Well, I personally believe we, our generation, will go up in the rapture, but then there'll still be believers here on the planet. The gospel will still be preached, 144,000 uh, Evangelists preach, the two angels preach, the two uh, the angels preach, the two witnesses. 
I mean, the Bible will still be here. I mean, hopefully this message will still be maybe on YouTube or whatever it is available. So after I'm gone, somebody will find it and watch it and, and go, my God, that 2015, that guy was talking about it. And he's gone now. I mean, and all these people are gone. And wow, it's the Bible. It's the truth. If he can find the Bible, hopefully he'll be able to find the Bible somewhere. Probably won't be any paper Bibles. They'll all be burnt. But somewhere, somehow, maybe on the, if there's still something like an internet or some digital environment, they might be able to find something. Or maybe there'll be, you know, a Denzel Washington with the book of Eli. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? He had the, he had the, uh, the Braille Bible memorized in the King James, and he's dictating the whole thing. I mean, that was, that was powerful at the end there. I'm telling you, it was powerful. I wept. But again, you, those are just, you know, those apocalyp apocalyptic movies. I mean, they're just, you know, they're all far-fetched. But hey, maybe not so much far-fetched. You know, when I read the book of Revelation, I mean, I see some crazy things happening. I mean, meteor, meteors falling from the sky and, and like a third of the population is dying and stuff like that. Pretty crazy things. People still cursing God. But there'll still be believers, people getting saved. The gospel will always be preached. The Holy Spirit is not leaving the earth. Believers might be living in the, in the rapture, the church, but the true church, not the fake, the phony, the baloney. The true saint of God removed in the rapture from God's wrath, but even in the midst of God's wrath, there will, there will still be mercy. God will still have mercy on those that will repent, but those people will have it probably the, the, mo the, the mo most difficult because their heads will be chopped off probably for not bowing before the Antichrist system. For not taking the mark of the beast. They're going to go have to go and hide wherever they have to hide and believe God for supernatural provision. So if you're watching this or listening to this, who knows how many years from now, somehow, some way, I'm gone and the Antichrist has risen as the Bible has prophesied, which will absolutely, 100% guaranteed to happen. It's not some theory. It is true. Turn to Jesus Christ and believe God. Get a hold of the word and believe God for supernatural provision, for supernatural protection. He protected Elijah from the prophets of Baal. He, he sent an angel to give him food. I mean, come on. God is a supernatural God. He's certainly not bound or limited by systems of man or systems of demons. Hello. So in a nutshell, here's what I'm trying to tell you. Those money changers were the bankers who created the money, controlled the money, worked with the, the governments, because the Pharisees were not just religious leaders. They were the government. Do you understand me? Because the law, they enforced the law. They stoned people to death if they believed that they broke the law. And even the Romans didn't touch them in that area. They said, they, we will let you have your law. That's what's happening now. I, I, there are parts of England where there's Sharia law. Even the, the British police don't even go there. Whole communities of Muslims living under their own Sharia law. In whole community, they're converting churches to mosques in Europe. In, in France, it's happening. So they like the fact that two more million Immigrants are coming. Who are going to have probably 5 more million, 10 more million babies in the next 10 years? Nice. Collapse the European economy. Put stress, put a burden on the European economy that, that I mean, you know, after a while, you know, you can only bear so much load. It's going to, I mean, it's right now on the edge. A little more pressure, the thing's going to collapse. Do you understand me? So, so they like it. They keep putting pressure, 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 pressure to collapse the global economy. Create World War III. And what happens? They come as the saviors. 
The Antichrist comes, I'm your savior. I will save this. We need one more government. No more war. I control everything. The money's safe. We got one money now. All the other monies were unstable. We got one money. You understand me? And then everybody thinks he's God. He's the savior. Because that's what Satan wants everybody to think, that he is the savior. And worship and bow down before him. Worship him. You understand me? That's how this whole thing is working. Go all the way back to the Tower of Babel. One man, Nimrod, a type or a representation of the Antichrist, rose up to say, everybody, gather. When God said, scatter, they said, gather under me. We'll build a tower, 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 tower. Reach the heavens. Do you understand me? And God sent confusion upon those plans. And those plans have been in confusion. But... In the final days, the Lord will allow, because see, if you read the book of Revelation, remember the, all those scrolls, trumpets, and everything, remember? He, he, gi he gives the first thing happens, he gives power to the, the horse, pale, dark, and all that, you know. In other words, God will finally in the end times give, uh, give power back to the system for a season. But there's still something holding that system back. It's not able to fully operate. And that's the church, the true church that stands in the gap, preaching the gospel, praying, interceding. And when that's gone, it's over. And then God will say, okay, I am now giving power to the system and allowing the famines, the wars, and then the rise of the full antichrist system for a season. To try to control the planet, but it will not succeed. It will not succeed. But even though it's short, all hell will break loose on earth. If you don't believe it, read the book. For a season, seven years, but at the end, the Lord comes riding on a white horse. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. With all of his angels and saints. To set up his 1,000 year millennial kingdom on earth. That's when we will know true prosperity, true peace on earth. Where the lion and the lamb will lie together. Jesus. And all the nations will be ruled with a rod of iron. And all the kingdoms of the world will become the kingdoms of our God and his king and we will rule and reign with him for a thousand years on this earth so heaven is not an escape heaven is where we go to gather for the invasion so the rapture is not an escape people think that I believe in the rapture because I'm, I'm just trying to escape no 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 the rapture is when God's armies gather from all over the world in heaven, purified at the judgment seat of Christ, crowned, and then we come with the king of kings as kings. He's the king of the kings. Lord of lords, we will be the masters and, and rulers of the world with him together. Because the money masters think that they are the rulers of the world. We are the true rulers of the world. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ are the true rulers of the world. But the church right now is clueless to this. They're like, oh. I can't even get out of bed to go to church on a Sunday. Oh, it's raining outside. Oh. They ain't ruling over nothing. Can't even rule over their flesh. Get up out of bed and come to church on a Sunday morning. That's what we're dealing with. What are you going to do with those people? I shudder to think what's going to happen to them. Half of them are going to be left behind. That's guaranteed. That's also scripture. The foolish virgins, the lazy ones who didn't get enough oil when there was time, didn't rise up in the power of the Spirit and, and, and do what God called them to do. They fell asleep. While they were sleeping, the rapture took place. They woke up. Everybody's gone. And they said, oh, no, no, please take me, Lord. He says, it's too late. The door is shut. 
you're not left on the earth to go through the tribulation. So the rebellious church will go through the tribulation to be purified. The faithful church will go to heaven to be purified. I'd rather go to heaven to be purified than stay on earth to be purified by God's wrath. Because he will chastise those whom he loves. But the rebellious will be chastised through the tribulation. You better not be rebellious because I'm telling you what's about to happen on the earth. You will not even. There are no words to describe for, for me to tell you what's going to happen. Unless you have a true revelation and the fear of God grips you. You're just going to be nonchalant. And you're just going to be lazy. You're going to live in sin. You're going to be a compromised, lukewarm Christian. And you're going to get slapped silly when the time comes. I'm telling you right now. Wake up. Wake up, church. Wake up. 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 Redeem this time because the days are evil. Evil, evil, evil. You think what's happening is bad? <laughs> There's nothing. This is like a small altercation, skirmish, pushing and shoving. I, World War III is coming. Pushing Russia on one side. Look at what they're doing in Ukraine. The whole thing was manufactured again to create conflict. I mean, look at it. Two years ago, there was nothing going on in Syria or Ukraine. And now look at what's happening. What will happen next year? Which nation are they targeting next? All it takes is one bomb and then stir up chaos. And the media is already immediately to to give everybody the, the lie, the false picture of what happened. I mean, immediately blame this one did it. No, nobody knows. And they just believe that that one did it. And that one did it, so let's go attack them. It was like, yeah, let, let's go attack them. That's how they start wars. It's so easy. It's so easy to start wars. Everybody's ready to fight anyway. And so just blame somebody. Point the finger, everybody wants to hate them and attack them. And yet, he didn't do anything. He didn't even have anything to do with it. He's just an innocent bystander. Just getting shot with a stray bullet. But that's how this whole demon-infested system works. Through lies and deception and hate and murder and lying and cheating and stealing. Do you understand me now? So Africans, I got a question for you. You're going to keep running away from your nations, hoping to find safe haven in Europe, which is about to be shot to hell, or are you going to go back and take your nations back for God? You're going to be so selfish that if I just survive, get my few hundred dollars from the government, I'm, I just eat, I'm okay, or are you going to go back, go back and kick the devil out of your nation? Huh? I'm staying here in Turkey to kick the devil out of my nation. I got a U.S. passport. I can be out of here tomorrow. I'm not leaving. I ain't going anywhere. I'm the one who came back. Everybody's trying to leave. I'm the one who came back on an assignment. And woe unto me if I don't fulfill my assignment. Because I'll have to pay. I'll have to stand before God and give an account for my life and my calling. What about you? You going to rise up and do something about it? Or are you just going to complain like everybody else does? I wish the government would do something. Government ain't going to do anything. They can't do anything. They're not going to do anything. You have to do something. You are the government. The government is on his shoulders. We are the government of the kingdom of God on this planet. We must rise up in the power of the spirit. Hallelujah. And to take our nations back, we must preach the gospel. We must sound the alarm. We must do whatever we can in our own power. You might say, well, God, Pastor, what am I supposed to do? Pray and do your share. That's all God asks you to do. Even if you just reach three people, reach three people. Because if you reach three people, I reach ten people, he reaches twenty people, we're going to reach somebody. So we must do something. And the church, the church has been given this assignment. But the church can't sleep. 
church must rise, must rise up in the power of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power to be a witness. To be a witness. Witness of the kingdom. Witness of his power. This is our calling. This is our greatest hour. This is our privilege. Hallelujah. I know I am not much of a motivational speaker. Everybody hold hands. Let me just motivate you a little bit. Motivational speaker. Your best life now. Seven steps to your prosperity tomorrow. I'm just sorry. I have to tell you as it is. How to get your next beach house. How to retire at 30 and live on a, a, a tropical island. Not my kind of message. Not much of a life coach, I'm sorry. 